So today what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back and I'm going to highlight kind of the nine top points. I'm not going to re-preach every sermon, don't worry. Um, but I'm going to highlight the nine top points that we talked about. And what I'd encourage you to do is, and we'll put all nine of them up on the screen as we go along, that if there's one or two in particularly that you feel like really speak to you, maybe make a little note of it and then go back and you can listen to the full message on our podcast or on um, YouTube and, um, you know, let that word really get in you so that we can continue on our journey to freedom. All right. And then I'm going to share with you a couple of uh, final thoughts on truth. And then when we're done with that, we're going to have the worship band come back up. And we're going to do one more song. And then we're going to let you guys close out the service by taking communion together and being the church. Like I said, as soon as I stop talking, that's when church starts. Amen? So uh, with that, uh, let me pray. And then we'll jump into it. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for your precious, holy written word. And we do ask today that you give us eyes to see and ears to hear, a heart to receive what you would say to us. Holy Spirit, I pray that while I talk, you would speak to the hearts of each and everyone here, that they would hear what you want them to hear, um, that we would hear truth and that that truth would set us on the path to freedom. We love you and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, all right, here's, here's the highlights. Here's the highlights of what we learned in this season uh, titled Living Free. The first place we started, we'll put it up on the screen, was that you can be held captive and not know it. You can be in captivity and not even be aware of it. We learned this from Jesus' teaching when he actually gave that statement that you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. The people he was speaking to uh, took offense at it and said, what do you mean we'll be set free? We've never been in bondage to anybody. We're Abraham's descendants. He says, if the sun sets you free, you'll be free indeed. And so uh, what we've been doing is, is really all of us hopefully taking a really hard look and, and coming to God and saying, God, is, is there something holding me that I'm not aware of? Is there something holding me back from the life that you would have me to live? And the first step in learning to live free is recognizing the fact that there are areas in our life that we're not yet free. I shared with you, I was pretty vulnerable and shared with you a couple of areas where I'm learning to live free. And even just this last week, I feel like God has revealed some new areas to me and some new things to me where, hey, there's still some stuff here in this area that you can get free from. And so it's an ongoing journey. Um, and so... Uh, the real takeaway from this is that hopefully we develop this lifestyle of continually coming to the Father on a regular basis and doing a checkup, right? Is, anything, is there anything holding me? Anything holding me back from living the life that you would have me to live? And uh, anything that I need to be set free from and then just continually making adjustments and growing and learning in that. And then the second thing we talked about was uh, the journey matters. Remember, we looked at the children of Israel and their story in the book of Exodus and what an important journey it was for them from captivity to freedom. And then Pastor Jill taught and she said this, uh, and I just loved it. She said, God is not as interested in getting you there quickly as he is in getting you there ready. And I loved that statement, man. That was just a truth bomb that just when, when I heard it, I wasn't here when she spoke, but I listened to it on, on uh, YouTube. And when I heard that, it just dropped and resonated in my heart. What a beautiful truth uh, that God is not as interested in getting you there quickly as he is in getting you there ready. And so the journey matters. And again, we learn this from the children of Israel, who a journey that could have taken 11 days took 40 years and actually an entire second generation in order to enter in because it mattered that they were ready. They had to be ready to enter the promised land. They had to be ready to live the life that God wanted them to live. And there was some work that had to take place before they would be ready to live that life. 
And so the journey matters. And I'm convinced of this, that there's areas in my life where I may never make it all the way to living that total freedom that God has for me to live. But I'm going to get as close as I can. And the closer I get, even if I don't make it all the way, the journey still matters. Because the closer I get to living free, the closer my kids will be to living free and my grandkids to living free. And that's the story in Exodus. Moses, you know, he didn't make it. Him and his whole generation did not make it to the perfect will of God. They did not make it to the promised land. They didn't make it to that place of freedom that God had for them. But they got right to the edge. And we can be bummed out and disappointed about how they didn't make it. But man, they led an entire next generation of people right to the brink. And then that generation just stepped right into freedom. And I'm convinced that there's areas in my life where I may not make it all the way, but I'm going to get right to the brink before I draw my last breath. And then my kids, they're going to be able to say, you know what, Dad took us this far. Let's just step on the rest of the way. Amen? Amen. The journey matters. And then uh, we said this, that there are pitfalls along the way. On our journey to freedom, there are, I saw, four primary pitfalls from the children of Israel's lesson that we need to avoid or be aware of. The first one we talked about is that when we begin on our journey to freedom, captivity often tightens its grip on us or bondage often tightens its grip on us. We saw this with the children of Israel. As soon as Moses comes to deliver them, set my children free, Pharaoh, who's a type of the devil in this story, does what? He tightens his grip on the children of Israel. He makes, he increases their bondage. He increases their captivity. We see this play out in natural lives where somebody makes the decision to, I'm going to get clean and sober and it's time for me to stop drinking and doing drugs. I'm ready to get free. And as soon as they step out to try to do it, the temptation to do those things increases in their life. Uh, we see this in our, we might see this in your life where you're determined to get free from a life of fear and and you see God's truth that he's not given you a spirit of fear but of power love and a sound mind and so you take that stand I'm I'm going to live free from fear and the first night you have nightmares like you've never had before or just those temptations to 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 live in fear increases um I shared this with um uh, several people this last week, uh, I'm of the persuasion that healing is part of the atonement, but that by the stripes of Jesus, we are healed and that physical healing of our bodies is provided for in the atonement of Christ now in this life. And so I believe that it's part of my right as a child of God to walk in divine health. That's just, that's just what I believe. Um, but I've always had to fight for it. It's never come easily for me. I've always had to fight for my healing. And um, a few weeks ago, so we've had, we've had a few instances of that. I had my elbow, I've had the separated tendon and um, ligament both completely separated. One attaches to the muscle, the other attaches to the bone. I can't remember which is which. Uh, I do remember how bad it hurt. And I went to the doctor and had an MRI, and uh, they said, yeah, this is bad. Uh, they wanted me to do a little bit of physical therapy and get the, the level of pain that I was in. They said, if we do surgery now, it's just going to be too traumatic. Let's do a phys- little bit of physical therapy, get some of the pain um, under control. Then we'll come in and we'll do surgery. Uh, one Sunday morning, uh, somebody in the church uh, said, man, we just need to pray for our pastor. They brought me up, prayed for me, anointed me with oil instantaneous. The pain was gone, and I've been pain-free ever since. That was an exception. Um, then I shared with you guys about how bad my knees have been. I have a, had a torn meniscus in this knee that I hurt wakeboarding. I'm kind of proud of that. I'm kind of proud of that. I'd be more proud if I was like doing like a double flip when it happened, but I was actually trying to get up. <laughs> and I never got out of the water before I was screaming in pain. That was about the time I decided that my... I used to be a pretty avid water skier. That was the, the, the time I decided, okay, my water skiing and wakeboarding days might be over, and I haven't tried again since. Uh, and I never got it dealt with. And then this knee, I actually fractured my, is it the tibia? What's the lower bone? So the socket where the, where the knee goes in. And I did that playing softball, and I'm not so proud of that. 
I was sliding into home base and my foot stuck and it jammed my leg and I actually fractured the bone. So I went and got x-rays and the, they were saying, now how'd you do this again? And I was like, I was playing softball. I was sliding into for home base and she said, yeah, you shouldn't have been able to break that doing that. We might need to get a bone density test done because you might, you've got something else going on here because you should not be able to break your leg sliding into home base. I said, you have no idea how fast I run. <laughs> like the G-force, the G-force when I hit home plate was, I, I know the average person would not be able to do it, but you have no idea. I, I actually said that to the doctor. <laughs> she just shook her head. And uh, so recently, my no knees had been so blown up so bad that um, truly it was hard to walk. Um, I could not get up out of a chair without taking both hands and, and, and pushing myself up, and I would wince in pain from it. Um, and today, I stand before... And so Anthony um, kind of had a dream, a vision of the church coming and praying and laying hands on me and praying for me. And so, uh, I don't know, a few weeks ago or so, we did that. And uh, the next day, my knees hurt worse than they ever had before. I mean, it was worse. It was, it was so bad. The pain was, was just through the roof. I could take anything I wanted, and it didn't touch it. And uh, I had to fight for it. But wait a minute. We were, we, they, the, the truth says that if the elders pray for me, that the prayer of faith will heal me. So I believe that I've received the, the healing power of God in my body, and I had to fight for it, and I just had to keep saying, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed. A couple of weeks ago, Kim and I were out walking on the beach, and I hadn't told her yet this yet, but I said, you know, my knees have not hurt in X amount of days, which was crazy miracle, right? The day after I said that, my knees started to hurt again, okay? I stand before you right now, I kid you not, with, and, and I did this a few Sundays ago. I got all excited, and I said that, that we have to take action to our faith. We have to, so by faith, I'm, step, I'm doing something that I know I shouldn't be doing, and so I was stepping across these chairs, and I did one of these numbers, and I got to about here, and the pain was so bad. I, I don't know if you guys noticed, my face probably turned white. I thought I was going to pass out from the pain. It was so bad, and then I turned around and walked back, and I can't believe I actually, I think I jumped down about here or something, because I was afraid I wasn't going to make it, but I kid you not, I stand before you today 100% pain-free in my knees. And I said all that to just say I had to fight for it. I had to fight the good fight of faith. I, 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 didn't, I didn't feel it, and I didn't, and, but I had to fight for it. There's this, when, 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 when captivity, when, 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 you, when you learn a truth that is, has the capacity to set you free, captivity is going to try to tighten its grip on you. Anytime I'm prayed for, most of the time when I'm prayed for for healing or when I stand for my healing, it gets worse before it gets better. And it's the same way in other areas of our life. And I've seen this over and over again with addicts. And they get so discouraged because they want to get free from their addiction. And, and so we pray and, and we believe God with them. And then it gets worse. And they get so discouraged. That's why we need to understand this. And we just need to fight. And we just need to stand our ground. The second uh, pitfall that we see along the way to captivity is that the temptation to blame the one who's actually trying to set you free. Children of Israel actually at multiple points blamed Moses for their captivity. They blamed Moses for what was going on in their life. And there is this pitfall, this temptation to blame those that are trying to help us live free for the pain that we're experiencing. The number th the, the third pitfall we talked about was that the message of freedom can sound cruel to those that are in captivity. There's a, there's a point in the story of the children of Israel where it says that um, they could not hear the message of freedom because of their cruel bondage and the level of captivity they were in. So when somebody started to speak about freedom to them, it actually sounded cruel. It actually sounded mean and hard. And boy, have I experienced this so many times. And then the fourth pitfall that we talked about was the temptation to go back. The children of Israel regularly struggled with this temptation to let's just go back to bondage. And, and I think most of us can relate to this, that on our journey to freedom, it, 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 we get into this place where, man, it's unknown. We've never been there before. And, and bondage or captivity, it may not be the great, greatest place in the world, but it's not really a terrible place. And after all, I've been there for so long. It's familiar. It's comfortable. I know it. 
It might not be God's best for me, but it's comfortable. It's, it's reliable. There's such a thing as a reliable bondage that brings comfort. And so there's this con- continue, there can be this continual temptation to want to go back into the known versus launching out into the unknown, the place of freedom. And then the fourth thing we talked about was that uh, there are things that you should take with you on the journey to freedom, and there's things you should leave behind. Some things you should take with you, some things you should leave behind. And you can go back and listen to that if that ministers to you. And then the next one we talked about was three basic principles to get from one place to another. And I think this might have been one of my favorites because it was a revelation God gave me um, in the middle of this series as I was um, kind of wrestling with the idea lot, like, okay, God, how, like, how do I get there? I, 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 I've, seen the, I, I've seen, I've identified an area in my personal life where I'm in captivity um, and I see your truth concerning it, and I'm ready to go on this journey to freedom, but it was complicated to me. It wasn't just, it wasn't just simple like you just snap your fingers and you're there or, or you just, you know, magic carpet ride, you know, to get there or something like that. Or call Uber. Like, that's how I'll get there. I'll just call Uber. <laughs> can you take me? Can you come pick me up in captivity and take me to freedom? <laughs> sure, that'll be 34 bucks. Awesome. <laughs> Can I get the Uber Excel? I want to take a few friends with me. It wasn't that simple. And so I was like, I was like God, how, how, do, how do I personally get there? And how do I help teach others to get there? And the Lord dropped on my heart these three basic, basic principles that apply to any journey we take anywhere, regardless of how simple or complex it is. Whether I want to go from the stage to this chair or whether I want to go from a place of uh, sickness to healing or fear to peace or however complex that journey is, the process is the same. And, And that's just simply this, that if we're going to get from one place to another, step number one, you have to be willing to leave where you are. If you're unwilling to leave where you are, you're not going anywhere. You're going to stay in captivity. If I'm unwilling to leave this stage, I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying right here. So step number one, you've got to be willing to, okay, I'm, I'm willing to leave this place. God, if you're not holding me here, I'm willing to leave this place. Step number one. Step number two, you've got you to follow directions, right? There's a path that leads from here to there. There's a path that leads from sickness to healing. There's a path that leads from poverty to prosperity. There's a path that leads from fear to peace. You have to follow directions and how to get there, and then we spent a whole Sunday talking about what those directions are for the believer, how to follow the leading of God, and you can go back and listen to that. And then the third basic principle is just simply don't quit until you get there. (laughs) If you're not there yet, don't quit. It's okay. You may never get there. It's okay because the journey matters. Just don't quit until you get there or draw your last breath and it doesn't matter anymore. (laughs) Right? Pretty simple. And then the sixth thing that we that we leaned into and we we really lived here for the longest time was that winning the battle of the mind is critical to living free. And then after we talked about that a little bit and the power of that. We talked about, we went into talking about these weapons that we've been given to help us win the battle of the mind, which was the armor of God. And we spent one week on all seven pieces of the armor of God and what it is and how we actually use it to win the battle of the mind. That was fun for me. I'd never taught the armor of God from that perspective before. I enjoyed it a lot. And then a week before last, we talked about how sharing with someone when you're struggling with truth is a powerful tool to help you confess your trespasses to one another. And we, we spent a whole week talking about trespasses and what those are and what those aren't and what that's supposed to look like. And basically it's this idea that 
when I see a truth in God's Word that by the stripes of Jesus I am healed, but I'm struggling with that truth, then I'm to confess my trespasses to someone. Or I see in God's Word that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, that I'm made in the likeness and image of God, but I'm feeling like a terrible, loser, awful, ugly, unworthy person, that I'm supposed to confess that trespass to a trusted brother or sister in Christ and say, man, I know God says this about me, but I'm struggling with this. I'm not feeling this, right? And that's a powerful tool in living free is that we begin to do this, be engaged in this kind of activity. And then finally, the ninth big thing that we talked about was that turning people back to truth is the responsibility of the church, also known or better known as or rightfully known as the ecclesia. And so as a, this is why I say church has not begun yet in about, 10, 15 minutes, church is going to start. And when church starts, that's when the ecclesia, you all, two or three are gathered in my name, begin to do the works of the church, um, which is, among other things, this activity of sharing where we're struggling with truth and turning one another back to truth. So there's this activity that's going on, and we're going to lean more into this as a refuge as part of why we're doing communion the way we're doing it today, is we're going to find more and more ways for this type of activity to take place. And we talked a lot about the Ecclesia. Um, last week's message was probably four or five messages in one. There was a ton of content in that, um, and some pretty important things shared about the church. But... Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about it because likely um, over the next two years, you're going to hear a lot of this kind of talk and a lot of shift. There is a shift happening right now in the body of Christ, and it's super exciting. So you're going to hear a lot about the Ecclesia, and we're going to see a lot of opportunities for us to be the Ecclesia. Uh, Jesus said that he would build his church his ecclesia. He didn't say he'd build his temple. He didn't say he'd build his synagogue. He said he would build his church, his ecclesia, which is two or more gathered in his name. And he said, uh, the gates of Hades will not be able to prevail against it. And so um, there are, and then he says, I've given you the keys to the kingdom. He's given the church, you all, two or three gathered in his name. You guys all have the keys to the kingdom of heaven so that Whatever is already bound in heaven, you can bind on earth, and whatever is already loosed in heaven, you can loose on earth. In other words, if it's not allowed in heaven, we shouldn't allow it in our community. If it is allowed in heaven, we should make sure that it's happening in our community. And you guys actually have the authority from God, the authority from the Father to go about and do that. So we're going to start giving you guys more opportunities to do that. Our prayer team is leaning in heavily right now to praying about where, where, um, where do we see the gates of Hades, by the way, is, is it's Satan's dominion, right? It's his, it's his where he rules. And so we're in the process right now of identifying where is Satan ruling in our community because uh, I got news for you. We're about ready to storm the gates. There, there's, there's a few things in particular that I've just had enough of. I'm not going to. I'm not going to talk about it this morning, but maybe I am. I don't know. <laughs> My heart for our school kiddos, particularly our middle schoolers, I've had enough, and it's time for the church to assail the gates of Hades and do some damage. I can't take it anymore. I can't sit by and watch it happening anymore. We got to do something about it. So our prayer team is in the process right now because prayer is um, prayer is um, the tracks that the locomotive runs on. Everybody likes the locomotive, right? Because it comes storming through, right? <laughs> right? Here it comes storming through. But that, that locomotive is only going wherever the tracks have already been laid, and the tracks are laid in prayer. So right now, the tracks are being laid. And the prayer team is on it. If you want to be part of the prayer team, see Julie, see Gary, see um, Anthony, 
We got prayer. There's prayer going on all the time. I mean, it, it, all the time, all over the place. Pray anywhere you want, any place you want. Just a couple of you get together and, 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 and let's lay these tracks because we're getting ready to go somewhere. So, uh, so that's, 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 that's our Living Free series. That's where we went. Now I'm going to leave you with one final truth before we close this up. Or one final thought on truth. Here's what I want you to know. There, there's, there's, there's some responsibility that comes with truth. Truth is um, revelatory in nature. Super important that you know this. Super, super important that you know this. God's truth is revelatory in nature. Meaning that if God doesn't reveal it to you, you're not going to get it. Uh, no matter how good the preacher is, no matter how many times the preacher says the same thing over and over and over again, no matter how strong the anointing, no matter um, how smart you are, no matter how much Bible you know, no matter how much Bible knowledge you have, which those are all good things to have, truth will only come to you when God reveals his truth to you. Truth is revelatory in nature, by nature. Uh, I could teach for weeks on that one statement. I'll give you one scripture in Ephesians 1, 17 through 18, a prayer that we have out there on the laminated cards, and we ask you guys to pray all the time. Uh, the Apostle Paul prayed this for the church at, at Ephesus, that they would have a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God, that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. Why do you need the eyes of your understanding to be enlightened? Because no matter how smart you are, no matter how much you read the Word, until your eyes are enlightened, you will not know truth. So we pray, God, give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. Open the eyes of our understanding that we might know what is the hope of your calling and what are the exceeding riches of your glory in the inheritance of the saints. Give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation. Truth is revelatory in nature. So with that, as far as I can see, God reserves truth for people who have two primary characteristics. I see two primary characteristics in God's Word that He reserves. Like you, if you don't have these two qualities, um, you're going to struggle to receive truth. The first is the childlike. God reserves truth for the childlike. In Luke 18, 17, we hear the story where Jesus was teaching and the children came and the disciples got all wiggity and tried to get to shoo the children away. And Jesus says, let the children come unto me. He says, you know what? In fact, unless you all receive me like one of these children... You're not even going to see the kingdom of God. What's he doing? He's teaching that you've got to have childlike. You've got to be childlike in your faith if you're going to receive truth. First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1:26 and 27 says this. It says that, that not very many who are wise, not many, very many who are mighty or strong, not very many who are noble, are called by God. But in fact, God chooses the foolish things, the weak things, and the simple things. I'll never forget the first time I ran across that scripture. I'm like, glory to God, I finally found something I qualify for. <laughs> right? Like any of you just feel disqualified, you're reading all this stuff, and you're like, man, I just don't measure up. And then I ran across this, and it's like, if you're wise, if you're mighty, if you're noble, you're out. But if you're foolish and weak and simple, you're in. Woo! Glory to God, I qualify. Sign me up. 
But, but, but it's, just, it's just true, right? And we, I've seen this so many times. One of the most frustrating things for me is trying to, trying to share truth with a really smart person is the hardest thing in the world. Because they're so smart, they rely on their intellect, and if they cannot understand it in their intellect, then it can't be truth. Right? But your finite mind, regardless of how smart you are, you are not going to understand God's truth unless you have this childlike faith. Whoever shall say unto this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and doesn't doubt in his heart, but believes that those things that he says will come to pass, he'll have whatever he says. A child is like, I remember when my kids were little, uh, Jeremy's in here first, it was awesome when they were little, because I could tell them anything, and it was true, right? It didn't matter, and I'd like mess with them and have fun with it, right? Like, because it didn't, I mean, if the, if, the, if the moon is made of cheese, dad said it, the moon is made of cheese. It doesn't matter, they had childlike faith. I could say anything, and they believed it. Whoever shall say unto this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and doesn't doubt in his heart but believes that those things that he says will come to pass. He'll have whatever he says. Yeah, but let's talk about the mountain. Is that a figurative mountain? Is that a literal mountain? <laughs> Is that like, like, like what kind of mountain was it? And when he said be removed, what, like what's the Greek? What's the Hebrew? Like, like let's, let's, let's talk about this a little bit. And I know a friend who... And all we're supposed to do is receive the truth like a child and say, okay, it says it, I believe it. Do I understand it? No. Do I understand trigonometry? No. Is it still real? Sure it is. Just because I can't understand it doesn't mean it's not. That's the beauty of being simple. There are so many things I can't understand. It is not difficult for me to believe something I can't understand because the list is long. <laughs> But for the really smart people who understand, and if they don't understand it, they're smart enough, bless God, I'm going to understand it, right? We got some of those in the room here this morning. Like, you're so smart, and it's not, listen to me, I'm not bashing smart people, it's cool to be smart. But, but, but you, you know, you're so smart, like, if you don't know it, well, hey, that's cool, give me a week and I will, right? Like, there's people in this room that you're smart enough, you can do that. I'll throw something at you that, that you don't understand, hey, no sweat, give me a week. I'll be an expert on it, because I'm smart. I don't have that problem. <laughs> hmm. So, so if, if truth is revelatory, truth only comes if God reveals it to you and he reserves truth for the childlike. Let's work on being more childlike. Let's just be simple-minded people. <laughs> Let's just be foolish people. We're just simple and foolish and weak enough because those are the ones God calls. He doesn't call the wise. He doesn't call the, the mighty. He doesn't call the noble. Let's just be foolish enough to say, you know what? If he said it, it's true. I believe it. Any of y'all figured out the virgin birth yet? I'm like so scared that somebody's going to raise their hand right now and say, <laughs> actually, actually, I did a study on it and I have figured it out. <laughs> Nobody's figured out the virgin birth yet. It's beyond our capacity to, to understand. <laughs> do I, but do I believe it? Mm -hmm. Is it true? Mm -hmm. The childlike, and then the, the, the second characteristic that I see God reserves truth for is those who, were, who will steward it well. This is really important, and this is what I'm going to leave you with, is the actual importance of stewarding truth. Truth, as near as I can see, must be valued, obeyed, and used for increase. Truth must be valued. In Matthew 13, 44, we see this uh, story. Jesus is actually going on this, like, parable rampage. He's, like, teaching one parable after another. And in the middle of it, one of the parables he teaches is the parable of the kingdom of God. It's like a man who is walking through a field and he finds a treasure and he so values that treasure that he goes and sells everything that he has and he buys the whole field. He buys the field because he wants, he sells everything that he has for this one treasure of truth. Buys the entire field, not because he wants to farm, not because he wants to start a, you know, put in an orchard or a vineyard. 
He buys this. He sells everything he has and buys this entire field because there's one truth in that field that is so valuable to him that he'll sell everything to get it. Truth must be valued. God reveals truth to those who value truth. Truth must be obeyed. It is actually, uh, it's actually God's mercy that, he, that, that truth is revelatory. Um, here's, here's kind of the big picture that I see. And Jesus actually said this, talked about this, when the disciples asked him, why do you teach in parables? Why don't you just teach, speak plainly? And he explains to them why. He actually explains to them why the whole purpose, like why is truth revelatory? Why, why is God mysterious? Why, why do we have to seek him for truth? Why is it hard to get truth? Why, why like, like, like Jesus could walk through these doors right now in physical manifestation and he could take the stage and I would rightly sit down and let him teach. And, 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 and he could just, clearly explain everything. And the disciples were frustrated with this. They're like, Jesus, why do, you, why do you teach in parables? Why don't you just plainly explain what you mean? And Jesus tells them why. He says, because there's a whole group of people out there that even though they have ears, they'll never hear. No matter what I say to them, if I tell them plainly truth, they are not going to hear it. They're not going to obey it. And here's the deal. Here's the kicker. Whatever truth you have, you are now accountable for. You are now responsible for. The dudes in the Matrix would say ignorance is bliss, right? <laughs> and so it's actually God in his mercy who withholds truth until you're ready to obey it. I am convinced. I know this. I know that there are truths that God has yet to reveal to me because I am yet not ready to obey them. So in his mercy, he is withholding that truth from me until I grow and mature to the place to where I'm ready to obey the truth once it comes. Because as soon as truth is revealed to me, I'm now responsible to walk in that truth. So it's actually the mercy of God. And Jesus teaches about this, talks about this. This is why I teach in parables. And then thirdly, and, and we'll finish with this, truth must be used for increase. This is a kingdom principle. Anything God gives you, anything, including truth, maybe especially truth, but anything God gives you, he actually expects you to take it and increase it. If God gives you money, if God gives you a, a career, if God give, blesses you with a business, he actually expects you to bring increase from it. Okay? We know this from the par parable of the talents. Jesus, again, speaking in a parable, says the kingdom of God. By the way, anytime you see Jesus use the phrase the kingdom of God, he is saying this is what my father is like, or this is how my father operates, or this is how my father thinks. Okay? So he says, the kingdom of God is like a man who, and I may butcher this parable a little bit, but a, a, a man who, who um, has great riches in a farm, and so he comes to three of his servants, and he gives one five talent, he gives another one two talents, and he gives one one, and he goes on a journey. He's gone for a while, and then he comes back, and he says, what did you guys do with what I gave you? The guy with five says, I took your five, I invested it, I worked hard, I made five more. He says, awesome job. Guy with two did the same thing. Guy with one, what did you do? Well, I was afraid I'd goof up, so I hid it. I was afraid of making a mistake. Um, I was afraid of failing, so I hid it. I didn't do anything, but here's your one back. And he gets rebuked. He says, you wicked and lazy servant. You should have at least put it in the bank where it could earn interest. Take it away from him and give it to the one who has five, who knows how to bring about increase. Jesus spoke those same kind of words concerning truth. He's talking about those that have ears to hear, and he says, to whom much is given... Or he says, he says to, to he who has, more will be given. But to he who doesn't have, even what he does have will be taken from him. In that context, he's talking about ears. Those who have ears to hear truth will be given more truth. But those who don't have ears to hear truth, even the truth that they do have will be taken from them and given to somebody else who, who will steward it well. Truth is a commodity. 
that our Heavenly Father expects us to use to bring about increase. Kingdom principle. Anything your Heavenly Father gives you, He expects you to bring increase about from it. He gives it to you to see how you're going to steward it. He comes back and checks on you. How are you doing with what I gave you? Oh, it's increasing. All right, let's give you some more. Okay? So, um, so I think I just wanted to make sure I closed on that so that you guys understood that there, there is a responsibility to truth and to stewarding truth and to managing it. And so um, I know what I'm doing right now is, is uh, because as I said, I, I know that there's truths that have not yet been revealed to me because I'm yet, not yet ready to obey. So I'm on this quest right now to, okay, God, search my heart and do this work in me um, that... Um, Increase my capacity to be obedient, right, to, to your truth. Because I'm, I'm kind of where, where the man who's sold all of his possessions and bought the field to get the truth, I'm, I'm kind of there, like, I value truth, so I'm so, like, addicted to truth right now. I'm, like, on it, like, I want more. It's like crack. You get a little bit, you got, you're like, I, I need more, right? Truth crack. Give me more, <laughs> Right? And, uh, and I'm on this quest for truth, but I also recognize there's some areas where the brakes have been put on. So I'm on this, okay, God, like, like let's do this work in me. Like, let's do this work in me to, to, to come and grace me to, to be more obedient, to walk fu- more fully in your truth. And so I'd invite you on that journey with me to, you know, let's just, uh, we've just begun on, on our journey to living free, okay? We're closing out this series, but the journey is just getting started to living free.